Bada bing, bada bam. Welcome to this week's Bacon a Mystery, Bacon a Murder episode. Guys, we're talking about a K-drama. It's called Lies Hidden in My Garden. And you know what? I'm coming up with a new name for this K-drama because it's like you're watching it and you think to yourself, oh my gosh, all the characters, they're gaslighting each other. I'm just Oof. watching it. They're gaslighting this person and this person. And then you watch a couple episodes and you're like, hee hee, oh my God, that's so crazy. Wait a minute. I just got gaslit. Like you as the viewer <laughs> are getting gaslit by the characters. This is literally Gaslighting 101. I don't even know what else to call this K-drama. And it's all, it all starts because a housewife, Kim Tae-hee, my literal queen, the queen of the nation, Korea's mother, starts smelling a very foul scent. Oh, you she's You have a the lot actress. of queens, by the way. No, 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 but she's like, Number top 10 queens. Top 10 queens. Top 10 queens. Kim Tae-hee? Household name? Everyone and their mother knows Kim Tae-hee. Oh my god, Kim Tae-hee? Are you Googling Kim <laughs> Tae-hee right now? You don't know what she looks like? Oh, shame on you. Why are we even getting married? Speaking of, till death do us part. In honor of our wedding month, we have wedding merch that's dropping. How cute is it? Because he's dead. Yeah, that panda's supposed to be dead. <laughs> So till death do us part and I'm dead. So I'm free again. <laughs> Basically. So we're apart. So yeah. It's dropping this Friday. You guys are seeing this on Monday. It's going to drop on Friday. Okay. So anyway, she starts smelling a very foul scent in her beautifully landscaped garden. And um, I guess I should tell you what I'm making before we get into the meat of the story. But I'm making s'mores cookies. I saw these on TikTok. And they look so easy peasy. They look like anyone can do it in their sleep, which probably means I will tragically fail at this. But I'm gonna try. I mean, really all you need are s'mores essential ingredients, not the Hershey's Kiss, get chocolate chips, and then pre-made cookie dough. S'mores cookies. They said the marshmallow should be just pillowing out. Like you got it from Leviant, Levian Bakery or whatever that famous New York City bakery is, okay? It should be like that. I'm gonna count them on their word. So anyway. She gets the smell, that one sniff of the nostril. It starts a cascade of events that honestly, I was pretty tense sitting through the show, considering how long each episode was, and it's a bit of a slow burner. So with that being said, let's get into it. Now, I was gonna start with my, um, I, I, I always wanna do the Korean names in Korean shows, but my fiance absolutely what? will never follow. Like his brain will never follow it. I don't know what it is, but I could say a Korean, he barely knows my Korean name. I don't know what it is. Yeah, so. it's just, it just adds processing time in my brain. Yes, yeah, so it so. takes like an extra second more and then I get fed up and I'm like, come on, keep up. You yeah. loser, keep up. So um, we're doing some Americanized names, right? The story starts with Jules. Do you guys know I actually take a really long time to come up with these names? So who's Jules, the main girl? Yes, she's Kim Tae-hee. She's played okay. by Kim Tae-hee. In the show, she's called like Churan, right? Mm. But uh, Jules, she is mm. one of the main characters in this show and it's gonna be her garden. Lies hidden in my garden, it's her garden. Jules is like your stereotypical thriller family like copy pasted. So the family consists of her, Jules, the perfect housewife with secrets, and her husband, Dr. James Park, the rich husband with probably even darker secrets, and their very unsettling son named Sawyer. Like he's in eighth grade, but he doesn't act like an eighth grader, he acts like an adult, and that creeps me out. Mm -hmm. I'm like, bro, when I was in eighth grade, I was doing some dumb stuff, and how are you so perfectly polished all the time? And looking like you just walked out of like a GQ teen magazine. <sighs> Sit down. And all three of them are like the poster children from the Korean dream. One more time, the husband's name. James Park. James. Doctor James Park to okay. you, okay? Yeah. Uh, but in the show, he's like Taeho. Okay. Yeah. So they live in one of those glass down mansions. If you're, if you're a visual person, Think Parasite Mansion, but even better, uh -huh, even uh -huh. more beautiful. Really? Everything is perfectly in place in this house. And it's not because Jules is the perfect housewife. She's not perfect in that sense. She's beautiful, but she's very mentally disturbed and only does cooking and cleaning once in a while. She likes to spend most of her days laying on the couch and zoning out at the whole ceiling. Like she is not mentally present in this house, in this family, in her relationship with her kid. She is like really out of it the whole freaking time. Hmm. Yeah. 
Okay. So the opening scene, some shit's going down, okay? Jules got some got some weird stuff going on in that noodle of hers. She keeps having these dreams, and a lot of them are dreams within dreams. So she's gonna she'll have a dream of herself walking barefoot through an enchanted looking forest. She can't see the sky because the trees are covering every inch of the blue sky, but it's beautiful. There's like sun streaming in through the leaves and casting shadows, and it's it's like a mythical place. It's like the first place I would go if I got like that stupid Apple AI headset. Like it looks beautiful. Then all of a sudden, a guy, maybe about her son's age, like a teenager, is kind of following after her in the forest. And he's wearing like a fox mask, only on half of his face. And then she wakes up and she's transported back to her glass down mansion where she's standing in front of her staircase. And she goes up. And there's one stair that makes a really loud creak. Wait, wait, wait. So he, she's woken up or no? It's a dream within a dream she keeps having. Oh, so she's yes. in the dream. She's in her own house. Yeah. Okay. And then she goes and opens the door at the top of the stairs. It's normally to her son's room. But this time, it opens into a hallway and she sees herself walking down this hallway. This is like a younger version of her. And I think this is the dream where we kind of figure out Okay, something's definitely wrong with this girl. So we see her before she gets married and she's coming home from vacation. She's so excited. She's got her luggage. She's got a bunch of shopping bags. She opens the door to her apartment. Ani, thou asso. So it's implied that she lives with her older sister, but her sister's not responding. Mm. And then she puts down her keys and goes, Oh, what's that smell? And we don't see it now, but we can presume that the sister is dead and the smell was her sister's rotting corpse. Keep this in mind, it's probably going to be compartment because the whole premise of the show, and particularly the opening episode, is guess that smell, what's that smell? Okay, I'm dead serious. Well, maybe I shouldn't say dead serious, but seriously. So Jules and her family, they had moved into this mansion about three months ago, and the place Strong parasite vibes, but not as pretty. And I mean, Jules refused to even look at it. Like she has her shades drawn at all time of the day. Like just, she likes it in pitch black. She wants to stay in the dark. She's clearly struggling with depression and it's just very dim. All the other housewives in the area, they keep trying to introduce themselves. Like the area is this uh, guard gated neighborhood called Cornelia. And every house is like Cornelia. And then number one, two, three, four, five. She's like Cornelia 79. And they have a group chat for the Cornelia neighborhood. And all these housewives are trying to get her to open the door and introduce themselves, but she just doesn't want it. She's home, but she refuses to listen to them, refuses to acknowledge them. She just blasts creepy classical music at home while she lays on the couch just zoning out in a very strange way. The husband doesn't talk to her? He does, but he knows she's got some uh, Not doing good. tangled noodles. Yeah, okay. yeah. And uh, they're, they leave a note for her, all the little preppy housewives. Dear neighbor, you moved in almost three months ago and we never got the chance to say hello. So passive aggressive, okay? <laughs> Your neighborhood group chat is Cornelia79. They stick it at her front gate and as they're walking off, one of the three ladies mutters, Oh, them's it. What's that smell? <laughs> So, you think our girl Jules got time for that? No, she's too busy peeping out her shades to make sure no one's approaching the house. And she's popping her antidepressants, good for her. But that particular day, she grabs a glass of water, takes her pill, and she's about to swallow it. But something kind of tickles her nose. And she coughs up her pill and the water into the sink. And she runs over to the water car carafe, is that what you call it, like the glass jars filled with water, and she sniffs it. Smells fine. And she looks up and she notices that she had left her sliding glass door just a tiny ajar. She's trying to let some fresh air in, but she could have sworn there was a smell. Now, another running theme in this episode is that this girl is obsessed with Hermes scarves. Every day she wears a new Hermes scarf and it's gonna be pertinent later, okay? So um, she has her an Hermes scarf just wrapped tightly around her neck and she rushes to the phone. Honey? And her husband responds. Honey, everything okay? Actually, I, I need to call you back, hold on. And he hangs up the phone. So we see her husband finally, and he's, we don't know, really know where he is. Well, we're gonna find out in like two seconds, but 
He has a business card open on his lap and it shows that he is the director of a pediatric hospital. So this is like a big shot doctor. This is not a regular schmegler doctor. He's like a big shot, right? And he, a woman approaches, sits in front of him. Oh yeah, we need to get the cookie dough. Yeah, it's right here. Oh yeah. Oh my God, it smells like kimchi. We really gotta get a kimchi fridge or something because every time anything we pull anything out of the fridge, it smells like kimchi these days. Oh my God. I feel like it's gonna take like one and a half, maybe two, because it needs to cover. Hmm. But it, they might all connect, honey. Okay, then maybe I can take some out later. Yeah, maybe you take out like two, just four. Maybe I, even three. No, four is good. You, they can't touch. They won't That's touch. the problem. They won't. Once they touch, then you ruined it. <laughs> but we touch. Anyway, he hangs up the phone and a woman walks into the room and sits in front of him. He hands her the business card. Hi, uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, that was my wife, but what's wrong with our son? So he's at an emergency teacher parent conference with him and the son Sawyer's teacher. Apparently, the perfect family son Sawyer has been dealing with what appears to be depression. Or can you, should we cut the marshmallow in half? Nah, yes. Mm, that might be weird. I think it'll be good. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, fine. No, no, it's fine, it's fine, go you for it. You think I shouldn't? I don't know, honey. Hey, maybe you're right. I'm gonna keep this one just for experimental purposes, for science, for research. Mm -hmm. Anyway, apparently the perfect family son Sawyer has been dealing with what appears to be depression. And the teacher says, Dr. Park, we understand that you guys have just moved and since he had to leave all of his old life and his friends behind, it can be a bit of an adjustment period. We also know that he has very excellent grades from his past school and when he originally transferred, he's doing well. But the past few days, perhaps the past week, well, we recently had exams in all the subjects and I'd like to show you his answer cards if you don't mind. She passes him the scantrons and it's just, Sawyer had bubbled in every single choice. Like you know how it's A, B, C, D, and E? And he scribbled in red pen all over it. Like it looks very scary. He's also been talking less as well, and he's been skipping meals, skipping lunch. All he does is put his head down on the table and sleep. We were wondering if um, perhaps there was an incident at home within the family, just to give us better clarity on how to move forward and how to handle this type of situation. The kid is not in the room, right? No. Uh -huh. So Dr. James Park is flipping through the scantrons, but he looks up at the teacher and he kind of glares at her. Like you're, he's, she's, the teacher is basically insinuating that something's happening at home. Mm. And the teacher says, oh, I'm only asking because uh, I told Sawyer that if he refused to speak to us, we would have to be calling his mom. And he finally spoke and he begged for me to call you instead, which is why we asked if there was something going on between him and his mother. Hmm. My wife has not been feeling well recently. I guess Sawyer must have noticed. Kids are pretty perceptive. He must be stressed from the sudden move, and I'm s sorry about this, but I will talk to him. He hands over the scantrons and is getting ready to get up, but the teacher stops him. I'm so sorry, Mr. Park, er, Dr. Park, but the problem here is... Sawyer said he'd like to be unalived. Whoa. And there is silence. Well, thank you for letting me know, but at that age, kids say all kinds of things very casually. We heard before that he, before he was transferred, there was an incident involving his mother. We were wondering if you could enlighten us so that we could better help him. We could be better equipped. Incident? You talk as if my son is a criminal. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm so sorry. That's not what I intended to mean. I'm sorry if it came off that way, but we were... I, that's not... Ex I'm starting to feel a bit offended. How about this? I will focus first on talking to my son, and then I'll come back and visit. Thank you for your talk. He gets up to leave and the teacher is left confused and kind of calling after him like, Dr. Park, you can't just leave. Dr. Park. The teacher seems scared of him. Yeah. He does have a very intimidating energy. Mm. Very intimidating. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. yeah. You, our teacher is usually that scared of parents. I in Korea, yeah. Oh, really? Especially like wealthier schools, yeah. Ah, usually, because... Oh, they rich and powerful. Yeah, they're just going to get you fired and no parent likes to hear bad news about their perfect kid. Bake it in the oven for 350 for 
12 to 13 minutes. The car ride back home with the dad, James, and the son, Sawyer, I mean, it's, it's as awkward as you would think it would be after Sawyer just got called in for an emergency parent-teacher conference because he told everyone that he wanted to unalive himself, so then, you know what I mean? But I think it's, it's really telling how much distance they have as a parent and child. They talk to each other so formally. Mm. And the dad talks to him with so many like thinly veiled threats, like not of violence, at least not right now, but it's just really creepy. Like he would say things like, let's not tell your mother what happened today. With your aunt's death anniversary coming up, she's very sensitive. And Sawyer just calmly says, dad, can we move back to Seoul? And the dad pulls his Mercedes over to the side of the residential street. And he says, we both know why we moved out here. You know why. You said you understood what we had to do for mom. Am I mistaken? Did you not understand? Damn, he's like threatening him, huh? Yeah, but the way he does it, it's like he never even raises his voice. It's even scarier that way. Yeah. Now, we get a flashback to a high school party where everyone is wearing some sort of fox or rabbit mask and Jules, the mom, seems to have lost it. She's only got one shoe on and she reaches into the bonfire because it's like one of those middle school bonfire parties. There's teachers in attendance, and she walks up to a random teacher with a mask on and smacks him on the back of the head with the log. Yeah. So this is the incident. Yeah. And uh, everyone froze, and you just hear Sawyer going, Mom? And she looks around just dazed and confused. So my best guess is maybe her sister was killed and her sister's killer wasn't caught and she just keeps finding the killer around or having flashbacks or having psychosis. I don't really know, but it is weird. Either way, they had to move. Too many stares, too many whispers, too many questions. And the husband says, James says, behaving like this, Sawyer, isn't good for mom. You know that, right? Yes, father. And with that, they drive home, only to find Jules wearing her cute little yellow midi dress, her mess scarf around her neck, standing in the backyard, staring at a single spot with a shovel in her hand. Honey, what are you doing over there? She turns around and sees her husband and her son. Oh, you guys came home together. I said, what are you doing over there, honey? I just keep smelling something so foul for the past few days. I wanted to see if a cat had buried a dead rat or something. I wanted to dig. Smell? He comes closer. What smell are you talking about? You don't smell anything? What about you, Sawyer? Do you smell something foul? No, Mom. I don't smell anything. Both Sawyer and her husband look so worried for her, but she keeps staring at the part in the garden where there's a bunch of butterflies gathering, and it smells. And over dinner, James tells her that, remember honey, you requested a vegetable garden in the back maybe three months ago when we moved in, so I totally forgot that I had, um, had a bunch of guys come in and put in natural fertilizer. I just looked it up and apparently natural fertilizer is very stinky, very foul. I said that we should start a vegetable garden? Really? Her husband stops chewing and stares at her. And it's almost like a warning sign. Oh, right. I said that. I, I think I remember telling you to buy that. And the way she talks to him so softly makes me feel like he's terrifying or that he's convinced her that she's crazy and possibly even threatened to leave her and abandon their son or something if she doesn't get it together. Uh, it's like, so that's why you say it's gaslighting? Yes, it's like, I don't know, but then I really can't even read her face. Uh, you don't know who's ga gaslighting, who's yes. telling the truth. Yes, because later on you're like, wait, is the husband completely normal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the tides keep flipping, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's at this point in time, it's like she knows she doesn't believe him, but is too scared maybe to challenge him or is maybe too scared to even question herself. It's just unsettling. Right, that must be the smell. And watching this, Sawyer gets it from his seat. I'm done eating. Time me that. Oh, th that's all you're eating? Sawyer doesn't respond. He's already halfway up the stairs to his room and James starts to confuse me. Like, does he like his wife or does he hate his wife? I don't know. Is he just trying to protect his wife? He says, oh man. Here we go. Get ready. For what? Our son's puberty, honey. You gotta write down every time he does this to you. And the minute he gets a girlfriend, I'll take it and I'll show her everything. <sighs> and she finally starts smiling a little and even picks up a bit of food to eat. And after dinner, her husband lays on the couch eating fruit and watching TV while she does the dishes. So he's like munch it. I don't know why this got me triggered, but he's like chop chopping it. He's like <laughs> on the couch. I'm like, bitch. 
the intercom system rings. Someone's at the front door. Now James goes to answer, but Jules stays doing the dishes. It's like she knows he doesn't want her talking to people, but then at the same time, it almost feels like she hates talking to people. Mm -hmm. Like she has intense social anxiety and hates being around people. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to say who's protecting who. Like is James doing this knowing his wife hates talking to people so he's being proactive? Or is he keeping her away from people? Mm -hmm. And she's just kind of following his lead and is scared to talk around people because she's scared he's gonna get mad. It's really confusing. It's weird, right? Now, at the intercom in Korea, you have these little cameras at the front gate and you can usually see who's there and you can talk to them. It's like a ring camera, but so much quicker. Mm. Yeah, and it's a neighbor named Hesu. She had just moved in across the street to the mansion across the street. And she's kind of like that rich, wild neighbor vibe. No kids, no husband, just a whole lot of money in a bright yellow Porsche, Porsche 911. Hello, I'm Hesu, the neighbor. I just moved across right there and I thought that I should introduce myself. James glances over at Jules, who looks down and pretends to be busy with the dishes. Oh, um, sorry, it's a bit late and we have some things going on at home. Would it be okay if we do our greetings perhaps during the day? Oh, I guess I didn't realize the time. <laughs> so sorry to be an inconvenience. Um, thank, and she's leaning closer to the camera to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. But she crinkles her brows. Oh, Dimse. <laughs> oh, Dimse, Dimse. Wasn't there a disgusting shit? shit. <laughs> is that what it is? Bro, it's this whole episode. It's oh, disgusting shit. <laughs> oh yeah, that's the whole video. Okay. What is the word? Dimse, what is it? Oh, nemse. Nemse? Nemse. What does that mean? Smell. Oh, nemse. Yeah, but usually when you say like, oh, nemse, it's like, oh, smell. Uh. But it can also just mean like scent. Uh. Yeah, so James freezes at the intercom for a brief moment before turning it off. This is what's so interesting about this family. They both get exposed in the midst of their lying and gaslighting, but they never, they like bounce back as if it never happened. Mm. It's very interesting. You would think at this moment, any normal family, I'd sit there and be like, I told you so, and you don't listen to me, and you wait until somebody else tells you so. You know what I mean? And then he'd be like, no, honey, you guys are just crazy. And then you'd be like, did you just call me crazy? Did you just call me crazy? Right? But they just, he freezes at the intercom, turns it off, walks back to the TV, and Jules stares at him, stares at her dishes, and instead of addressing it all, James goes, honey, what are you doing? Come here, uh, let's watch my interview together. <laughs> she turns off the water and sits down at the couch. He's chomping away on some apples. <sniffs> and Jules just sitting there, perfect posture, ballerina style. My hair looks so weird. And my makeup this time looks a little patchy, huh? So he's basically like a doctor that gets interviewed for all these news networks like CNN. You know when they bring in like an expert or whatever. And then she says, no, you look good, honey. That was the woman that moved across the street, right? Yeah, she's a bit annoying, isn't she? Did you run into her? I saw her briefly through the window earlier today. Yeah, I asked the realtor and they stated that that house was gonna be empty since there's a bit of a situation over there, but I guess you moved back in. What a shame. I thought the empty house across the street would feel a bit more private for you, a little bit better. He tries to change the subject. Honey, you did such an amazing job picking the apples, they're delicious. <laughs> He reaches to grab another and starts cutting it and his phone is ringing on the table. He refuses to acknowledge it. He literally refuses to even answer it or look at it. Honey? <laughs> your phone is ringing. What he, a bizarre interaction. Yeah. He picks up and she walks away to give him some privacy, but she's still listening to him. And his whole energy shifts into a much more serious tone, which makes sense as the caller ID said a man named Ben from a pharmaceutical company was calling. But he says... I think you're crossing the boundary a bit, don't you think? You keep saying absurd things without any fear, it seems. You wanna go night fishing? Let me think about it. The couple head upstairs, and it's like a nightly routine that James brushes Jules' hair for her while she's lost in thought. And so he asks, are you still thinking about the smell? Oh, no, no. It's nothing, but I can have it checked out if you like. And what about the noises? Have those still been happening? The noises? The noises you said you were hearing from the second floor when you were home alone? Oh, no, I, I'm okay. I know. Sarah and I are extra sensitive around this time since we both know what you're going through. 
But we want this time to be different, okay? I'm sorry, because me, you, and Sawyer are sorry. And he hugs her from behind, and it's just, the whole thing is weird. They don't feel like a real couple. There's so much distance. But sure enough, there's pictures of them all over the house hugging. So while they're being the world's strangest couple, Sawyer goes downstairs to get water, and he starts staring outside into the backyard where his mom was sniffing around. So I don't know. To me, that's given he's gaslighting too, okay? And he smells something, but he didn't admit it. Yeah. So James lays down, and Jules stays up to stare out the window. And she remembers seeing her sister's her sister dead on the bed, seemingly murdered. She goes to throw up in the toilet, and James hears her, but he doesn't. He doesn't open the bathroom door. He lets her have her privacy. The next day, she decides she wants to get her life together, and Jules starts cleaning the entire kitchen, vacuuming the entire house, and that's when she finds underneath the stairs a tiny little like knickknack. It's like a little plastic pink ribbon, but it's not a woman's type of ribbon. Like it, if her husband was cheating, it's not the type of ribbon you would see like a full-grown adult wearing. It's like very like five-year-old ribbon. Mm-hmm. And it's weird, like. It's weird. So she kind of pockets it, and she's intrigued, but she doesn't really think about it. She keeps cleaning until the morning light turns to afternoon light, and she's rearranging the entire place. Side note: she's got a strong love for Hermes silk scarves, and we know it's Hermes because they—that's the whole thing later, okay? And she's wearing it on her hair this time. And when she's done in the kitchen, her nose crinkles a bit. That f-ing smell. She smells it. She, for the first time we've seen her, she walks out the front door, beelines it to the new neighbor's house with a bright yellow Porsche parked outside, and it's clear she's not there to make friends. She's on a mission. She goes to reach for the intercom, but she hears a voice behind her. I'm sorry, who are you? Oh, um, and she's very meek. Like, she's very socially scared of everyone. I live, uh, I live there. Oh yeah, across the way. Hi, so nice to meet you. I'm Hezu, I just moved in. Jules refuses to shake her hand, and she starts fidgeting with her neck instead. Actually, I'll just be get, getting going now. Oh, oh, speaking of, what was that smell from your home? Probably not coming from the inside, right? But outside there is a bit of a smell, no? It's fertilizer, natural fertilizer. It usually smells foul. Mm, I don't think so. Natural fertilizer doesn't smell like that. But you should check it out. It's really strong. It, it smells like something is rotting. <laughs> We see Jules rush home and immediately takes her shovel to the ground. And this is when we see a whole new side of town. The show alternates between these two women, perfect Jules and now miserable Sora. And both of them have very interesting husbands and interesting relationships. Sora is the evil girl from the glory. Again? Bro. She's everywhere. But she's not evil in this one. Uh I'm telling you, her acting, chef's kisses. Wow. There are so many parts where she doesn't even speak, but her acting is something else. Mm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. She is a poor pregnant woman that is married to a vile domestic abuser. And these two families are going to collide in the most crazy way, okay? She lives in a rundown apartment complex where the yellow hallways look like the back rooms and there's constant leaks everywhere. But that's not the problem. The problem is the walls are thin and every single night and day, every single person in the building can hear her getting beaten by her good-for-nothing asshole husband. Even the building maintenance man begs her to leave him, to report him, but she says she can't because I'm still alive. AKA, I'm gonna report him and then I'll be dead. Mm. He throws whatever he wants at her picture frames, food, furniture, and demands she clean it up and she's cleaning her own wedding photo frame that he threw at her and she cuts her finger. Clumsy! Can you not be more careful? Ben the husband reaches into his pack- backpack and throws an Hermes box on the ground. What, what is this? If I tell you, would you even know? Just use it. Thank you. Are you hungry? I'm okay. Look at you. No one would even look at you and think you're five months pregnant. You've gotten even skinnier. You're like a skeleton. Jesus Christ. Other women crave things when they're pregnant. What the hell's wrong with you? It's not even about you. You think the baby likes being cramped up in there? Huh? This is incredible. Watch out, watch out. I said it looks bakery level and he said I wouldn't go there. I'm going there. It looks like... I don't know what happened there. You think that's the one with that's the That's the one you did. <laughs> With the giant wow. marshmallow. It looks so good. It smells good. The whole house smells delicious now. 
Yeah. <sighs> okay, well, we should let it cool for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My niece is in her nursery rhyme era, and I've been thinking of all the little bops I wanna sing for her when she's of age. Sure, there's Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but like what about, hey, you need to pay your taxes? Or what about summertime is credit score time? Like, th that sounds like a good one, okay? That's gonna be my anthem when she grows up. But seriously, summertime is such a great time to boost your credit score, and Chime is here to be your summer romance, your summer best friend. Chime is dedicated to making the scary task of boosting your credit score is so much easier. So with the Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card, you can build your credit score safely with everyday purchases and on-time payments. Plus there's no annual fee, interest, or credit check to get started. And I, I like that you're building your credit with your own money. It makes the whole process, at least for me and everyone that I've personally recommended Chime to, it makes the process of building your credit score feel that much better. But that's not the only reason I love Chime. With Chime Credit Builder Visa Credit Card and a qualifying direct deposit, you can request to receive your paycheck up to two whole days early, which I know that can make a huge difference. And speaking of another thing, Chime offers Spot Me, which is a fee-free overdraft up to $200 when you set up a qualifying direct deposit. So that peace of mind, chef's kisses, irreplaceable, I tell you. You get access to 60,000 fee-free ATMs, which is more than the top three national banks combined. What I tell people is, Chime helps you help yourself. So start building your credit up. Open a Chime checking account with at least a $200 qualifying direct deposit to get started. Get started at chime.com slash baking. That's Chime dot com slash baking. The Chime Credit Builder Visa Credit Card is issued by Stride Bank NA, member FDIC. Chime checking account and $200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply. Out of network ATM withdrawal fees may apply. On time payment history may have a positive impact on your credit score. Late payment may negatively impact your credit score. Results may vary. Anyway, and then he's like, huh? Daiki. A what? Strawberry. What? Stop mumbling and enunciate your words. I want to eat strawberries. <sighs> strawberries? <laughs> such a joke. He reaches into his pocket and hands her a $5 bill. She walks out to get some strawberries while the husband stares at the TV and on the TV he's watching Dr. James, the rich husband. And he's got this evil smirk on his face. He grabs his phone, Dr. James Park, and calls. Ah, Dr. Park, long time no talk. I'm watching you on TV right now and you just keep looking better and better, don't ya? But you also keep avoiding my calls. So my misunderstanding is only growing and I feel like my feelings are getting a bit hurt. And we hear him on the other line say, you keep saying all these absurd things without fear, don't you? <laughs> I guess I have no fear these days, you know? Why don't I try to be more afraid of you? How about some night fishing? I think 11 would be good. What do you think? Night fishing? Let me think about it. Come on, let's do it, Dr. Park. Besides, there's some things I want to give to you anyway. Sora goes to the market and finds organic strawberries, but she's not into it. Instead, she buys a carton of strawberry ice cream and starts bandaging up her finger. She's sitting on a bench and this is like the side of the road. She sees a group of teenagers like rowdy, having fun, drinking and smoking cigarettes. And she looks at them. Haksang, student, can I have one? And the teens yell at her, get your minds together, you weirdo. You start smoking and you're gonna have a kid like me. And they start laughing and taunting her. She gets up scared and walks home with her little baggie of strawberry ice cream. And when she gets to her apartment door, it takes everything in her to open the door. She's waiting outside for the longest time, just debating. What? You told me you did that. Yeah, relatable. Wait, wait, that makes it sound like I'm... No, huh? No, that makes it sound like you do this at this house. No, 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 my grandma, my grandma. Finally, she walks in and gets beaten again. He's kicking her, throwing her around the room, telling her that her cheap stench is gonna get on him. She tries crawling out of the bedroom, crying. There's cameras in the living room that she's hidden, but um, he drags her back into the bedroom and keeps beating her. And when he's done, he goes to sleep and she sits in the dark living room eating her strawberry ice cream with a, like her whole, she's completely shut off all of her emotions. 
She doesn't feel sad. She doesn't feel happy. She just has a blank stare all the time. So she's just blank staring at the wall, eating her strawberry ice cream with a busted lip, and there's an Hermes box open in front of her, and it's a bright orange scarf. And she goes to the bathroom and tries it on. And it's just kind of like the stark contrast between the scarf and the condition of the bathroom and just the, everything else that she's wearing. Why is there a mess scarf? Remember he gifted her the Hermes box? It's a scarf. Why? We find out later how oh, it's all connected. It's so bizarre, right? Like yeah. He's beating her and then here's a Hermes scarf. Yeah. Okay. It might have been stolen. And guess who loves wearing Hermes scarves, uh, right? Oh, oh, oh. So uh, huh. she touches it, fixes her hair, and she puts on the scarf and quietly starts taking pictures of all of her bruises. She messages them to a coworker slash Anni, and she says, Anni, can these be used as evidence? And the next day at work, she asks that Anni, will you go with me to the lawyer together? Of course I will. But will you even be alive then? So Sora and her friend slash Anni are receptionists at like a super fancy like Michelin star restaurant. Uh, not even like the, she's like a hostess. She has to hide her pregnancy to not let it show that she's pregnant, otherwise she'll be fired. And anytime her husband calls, she has to pick up even though he knows she's working and even though he knows that she could get fired, but he doesn't care. And I'm sure if she gets fired, he'll beat her up for it. And he'll literally honk and scream outside her workplace because he's so pissed that he has to pick her up. So she rushes to change back into her regular clothes and the Hermes scarf, she puts it on. And she gets into the car and she starts an audio recording before she gets in to record all the abuse. And he's like, what the f you know there's nowhere to park. You should get out early and wait for me. Do you even have a brain? Do you even think about things at all? I'm sorry, should have hurried. In the car ride, she sneezes and he screams, Aya! Jim, turn your head when you sneeze. Sorry. She starts looking for tissues when she opens the glove compartment of the box and out comes a girl's phone. But it's not even just a regular phone. It's not like another iPhone. The case of it is what I would only imagine a middle or high schooler to use. It's what? like completely bedazzled in like plastic ribbons, bows, like the whole case is covered. Not as, it's, if this is the phone, the case is like three times of the phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, yeah, right? Yeah, I know what you're talking about. And exactly. he, yeah, just tither it. Like, he's getting mad at her for being so clumsy, and he takes it and throws it back in as if nothing happened. And as he's frantically putting away the evidence, he's not looking on the road, and he slams onto his brakes before almost crashing into the car in front of him. She grabs the handle with both of her hands. And he looks at her, and he goes, Yeah. Most pregnant women cover their stomachs first. What are you doing? You value your life more than the baby? What is going on? Makes sense, you try to terminate the pregnancy behind my back. What kind of mother are you? Could I, I, what kind of mother am I? <laughs> Here you go again, talking back, are you? Sorry. But why does the GPS say Cornelia Drive? I thought we were going to my mom's house. He looks at the back. There's like this big fishing bag. It's, it reminds me of like a golf bag because I've never seen a fishing bag before. How much do you think is going to fit in there? What? Nah. If we fill it with $100 bills, how much do you think is going to fit? It's perfect timing. We're about to have a baby. We should try living like other people for once. And he starts laughing. And she smiles so that he doesn't smack her, but she's really concerned because all of this feels very illegal and very wrong, and he's definitely getting involved in some weird shady shit. Now, we get a flash forward. So that is September 19th, okay? September 20th, which is like the, let's say like 1 a.m. September 20th, Sora goes to her mom's house and takes a long shower in the bathroom. She keeps the water on, she's crouching down, letting it hit her, and she goes, she goes down to lay next to her mom. The thunder is going crazy. Who she's, is this? Sora, the pregnant woman who's getting beaten. Oh, 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 Yeah, so oh. remember she said, I thought we were going to my mom's house. So I guess she yes. just got dropped off, right? Okay. And uh, she's trying to be as quiet as possible to not wake up her mom who's, you know, sleeping. But she's crying. She's crying in her sleep. And the next day, like the morning, so she probably gets home around like 1 a.m. 
and then like 9 a.m. she wakes up and we find out that her mom has dementia and is scared of her own daughter, considers her daughter a nasty bitch and wants her out. It's very depressing, like it's another heartbreaking rejection. And as Sora is getting kicked out by her mother's caretaker, who really likes Sora, and she keeps apologizing like, you know, your mom loves it when you come. Usually she's very happy, but her condition's not getting good. You know, it, I'm so sorry, sweetie. And next time you bring that lovely husband of yours and I can make the dumplings that he likes. Yikes. And as Sora is blankly staring at the elevator, waiting for it to come, she gets a phone call. Yes, this is her. Right now? Where should I go? The phone call is very unsettling, but before she gets on the elevator, her mom comes out of the apartment and is standing behind her. And she says, Mom, they said my husband is dead. So Ben, the abuser husband, is dead. Mm -hmm. We don't know what the fork happened between the day that they pulled up to Cornelia Drive mm -hmm. and then all night, and then she comes to her mom's house. Yeah. And then this morning, and he's dead. Yeah. Meanwhile, Jules is frantically digging in her backyard. This is September 19th, so we're going back to the day before. Okay? Uh -huh. She's frantically digging in her backyard, and there it is. She starts maniacally laughing, okay? Because at least she's not crazy. We see in the soil, there are like what looks like two fingers buried in the soil. A hand? A, f yes. a person? Yes. What? Yes. what Meanwhile, Ben and Sora are driving up into Cornelia Drive, the neighborhood. And Sora is watching from the passenger side all these beautiful mansions with the families playing outside, happy, carefree. I mean, well, not all the residents. One of them is in the backyard with fingers buried back there, but that's a whole nother story, okay? I'm just saying. I mean, she's ecstatic, not because she found a dead person, but because she's not crazy. And then there's a knock on the front door. She places a pot over the fingers and goes to answer it. Well, not actually answers the door. She's staring at um, Ben through the intercom, and she's very afraid to speak. Ma'am, it's me, Ben. Ben Kim, do you remember me? I was in the car with Dr. Park with you a few times. My husband is at the hospital right now. Why are you here? Oh, it's just in the area and I had something to drop off. But ma'am, are you going to keep making me stand out here at the front gate? Meanwhile, Jules goes to call her husband, but he won't pick up. So instead, she walks out to see Ben. She's covered in soil from her digging. And he smirks and reaches into his pocket to pull out a business card. She looks terrified of him. Sora is waiting in the car and notices how terrified she looks, okay? Also, the scarf in her hair, the one that um, Jules is wearing, is the same one around Sora's neck. And she reaches for it, and she's confused. What is it that you want to drop off? Ah, it's this uh, fishing bag. It's a bit heavier than I thought though, so here, let me help you. He walks past the gate near her house with it, and he's, she's chasing after him, like, what are you doing, what are you doing, excuse me? Here, where should I put this? Just put it there. Meanwhile, Sora takes this time because now she's thinking, wait a minute, I'm in this rich neighborhood that I've never heard of. There's this really pretty lady with an Hermes scarf in her hair and I got gifted the same one. Is he cheating on me? And did he just bring me to his mistress's home? Huh. And she looks afraid of him. I'm afraid of him and I'm his wife. Mm -hmm. So then she thinks to that phone in the glove compartment. This guy is cheating on her, you know? So she grabs the phone and she tries turning it on, but right at that moment, a big like Doberman barks right at the door and she screams and drops the phone in between the crack of the car and the seat, you know, like the, the console in the seat. And the, the resident is like, oh, I'm so sorry. And continues walking the Doberman like nothing happened. And so Sora's like sticking her hands down there, but like when you're pregnant, you start getting bloated fingers and she cannot reach. It's not coming out. Meanwhile, Jules is dealing with her cre the creepy ass husband. Not her creepy ass husband, but Sora's creepy ass husband, the abuser. She doesn't want him to come into the house or snoop around, but he keeps going on and on and on about how he's never seen their house so up close and personal. And she keeps like trying to get in his way, like they're playing tackle football. And he's just in the front yard, but going on about how nice it is in person. It's nicer than in photos. And you know, I've only been to places like this at night, but wow, uh, during the day, you can see the view, the mountainside. See, I've only been to places like this at night. Like he would visit to visit Dr. Park to drop off things at night. Oh. Yeah, well, I gotta try this s'mores cookie because it's staring at me. Wow, the marshmallow is marshmallowing. <sighs> is 
Is it good? They said you can actually see. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's try this thing. I, I'm gonna try the part with the graham cracker. Okay. Mm. Mm. It's not bad. Wow. What do you think? Baby wipe. Mm hmm I like it. He's just very um very threatening in a way. Like he's not just complimenting their house, but he would say things like, Everyone should live like this one day, especially me, don't you think? That's my goal. Don't you agree, ma'am? I mean, we should all get a chance to live in a place like this. What does that mean? <laughs> He's freaking her out, so much so that she tries to gather up the confidence to tell him to get out. And she says nicely, please could you leave? I cannot accept the, the fishing bag without my husband's approval. Ben freezes and he smirks. And he gets so close to her that he's basically kissing her forehead and she's frozen in fear. Approval. And he slowly unravels her Hermes scarf, letting down her hair. And finally she screams, what exactly do you think you're doing right now? Oh, sorry, ma'am. It's just, uh, there was a bug in your hair. If I had told you, you would have moved. I, I think that you should leave and I need to call my husband. Stay right here, don't move. And she runs inside to call her husband, but he doesn't respond. She looks in the front yard, Ben is not there. Did the she close fishing, the door? No. What? <laughs> The fishing bag is, okay? But he's not. She runs back to where the buried person is. He's not there. She runs to the side of the house and rips open the curtain and he's taking pictures. Oh my God, ma'am. And he's saying this through the window. I'm so sorry. It's just the house is exactly my style. I wanted to get some pictures of the inside to show my wife. We've been thinking about moving soon. She's pregnant, you see? And I just wanted something to show her. Is he outside or inside? Outside, through okay. the window. Anyway, I should get going today, but please tell Dr. Park that we need to go night fishing tonight. He flaked on me last night and I was really disappointed. Tell him if he flakes again, I'll be even more disappointed in him. Bye now. And how is knife fishing? Just go fishing? At night, yeah. Mm. And so he walks out and Sora in the car is still desperately trying to get the phone out of the crack, but it's not working. She basically has to give up on it before he gets into the car and he seems so giggly and so happy. He's laughing maniacally. Hey, take a good look at this place. Cause soon, we're gonna live here. <laughs> Sora smiles, but she's still so stressed. All she can glance at is the phone that's stuck in the crack of the seat. Meanwhile, Jules looks behind her. And there on the staircase, inside her home, is the Hermes scarf that he had took from her hair, tied neatly around the staircase railing. He had been inside the house. What the? Finally, James, her husband, calls her back and she's frantically telling him what happened, but we don't know exactly what she's telling him happened. It, it seems like she focused more on the dead person than the interaction with Ben, which I guess it kind of makes sense, right? So James rushes home and the first thing we see is him standing over the pot and she's too scared to look at it. She goes back inside and she turns around and starts n like nipping, nervously fidgeting at her um, neck area and, he reali and she realizes that she doesn't have her Hermes scarf on like her little protection. So she runs inside to take her antidepressants and tries to calm herself down. And she watches as her husband is about to lift the little pot up. She turns around, she doesn't want to see it. And then she hears him come back in and the door closes. What was it? Honey, I'm so sorry, you must have been really shocked. What? Before we moved, someone buried something in here. And he throws something on the table and she starts screaming. <laughs> and he starts laughing. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm only teasing, Connie. I'm sorry. Oh my God, it's okay. But before, the, before we moved, the builders told us sometimes during construction, things get buried and sometimes they can rot. And she looks at the table and it's glove filled with sand. If it keeps smelling, let me know and I can call the builders in and they can, uh, uh, you know, Get rid of the smell. So sorry for scaring you. I just thought it'd be a funny joke, but I realized it wasn't that funny. Are you sure this was it? Yeah. Why? You think the previous owner buried a body or something? He grabs an apple from the counter and bites into it. And Jules looks so utterly confused. What's wrong, babe? Wait. You honestly believe that? He puts his apple down, grabs her pill bottles. Did you take your meds, honey? No, 
Honey, please, you have to believe me. It was someone's hand. Are you sure you dug it out? Are you sure you dug all of it out? I, I can dig it myself. I can confirm with my own two eyes. Before she can go out, he grabs her and hugs her tight from the back so that she can't go outside. And he tells her it's gonna be fine. You're not the only one that thought that, okay? I thought it was a real person's hand too, truly. But it was such a relief that there was no hand buried in our backyard. The reason you probably smelled that is because your sister's memorial is coming up soon. But once that passes, everything will be okay, okay? Jules calms down and looks at her husband. Look at me, Jules, you trust me, right? Honey, I didn't think I'm getting better at all. I don't think so. I think I keep making you and Sawyer suffer. That's all I do. And they both start crying and hugging each other and he says, no, no, you're not. Don't try too hard, honey. I don't care if something's wrong with you because we're family. And in that moment, James' phone buzzes on the counter. It's pharmacy sales rep Ben, the abuser, texting him. And he texts, on second thought, I revised the amount to 500,000. I want cash. So it sounds like Ben, the pharmacist, is blackmailing Dr. Park, right? He is positively blackmailing him. But for what though, right? They're all really shady people, Ben is bad, but Dr. Park has also got to be really bad too, right? Even his own son, Sawyer, is upstairs googling how to get an apartment as a minor. <sighs> James brings Sawyer a glass of milk and we see a very interesting thing. James tells Sawyer that mom wants you to drink the milk while it's warm. Where is mom? She's resting after taking her meds. Here, hurry and drink. You can see Sawyer hesitate and James, the busy perfect family doctor dad, is giving his grown ass son a glass of milk, which like, I don't know, maybe it's a cultural thing, but like, I can't just down a glass of, glass of milk straight up. I need stuff with it. But I know Korea's big on milk culture and James is uh, kind of watching him drink the milk. Then James goes to brush his wife's hair. And Jewel says, honey, I'm sorry to ask you this again, but you think soil can rot and smell like that? Like a, like a dead body rotting? I'm not sure. I guess all foul scents have similar smells, babe. Because I remember that smell very distinctly when my sister... <sighs> Why keep recalling something that makes you so anxious? Here, drink this tea. Um, it's a present from a colleague of mine, but it's herbal medicine. Helps you stay calm. Oh, it smells wonderful. And he intently watches through the mirror while brushing her hair as she sips on the tea. I don't think I'm gonna go night fishing with the pharmacy sales rep, Ben. I don't feel comfortable leaving you all alone after everything that's happened today. It's okay, you should go somewhere to vent your stress too. You haven't had time since we moved in. Besides, I'm not alone, I have Sawyer. The two cuddle in bed while thunder rages outside and James is stroking her hair telling her that she's going to be okay and he's going to take care of everything and we see Jules slowly drifting off into sleep but she wakes up from a nightmare and when she opens her eyes it's not James laying next to her it's Ben the creepy guy. What the f She starts breathing rapidly and he disappears but then appears again staring at her from the end of the bed and she wakes herself up and goes to throw away the Hermes scarf that she wore earlier that day that was found on the staircase railing. Yeah, and she's so creeped out, she just wanna forget about it. And as she's doing that, she goes to grab a glass of water, and she notices that not only is James not in the bed, but he's not home. And she debates on whether or not she should text him that she loves him and to drive safely, but she decides not to. And she lays in bed wide awake. Now, we don't know where James is, but the assumption that's being made in the show is that he killed Ben, okay? Because the next day, the next morning, remember, Sora gets a phone call at her mom's yeah. house that her husband is dead. So we're going to go catch up with Sora to see how she's doing. And I am so glad the actress in The Glory was not a one-hit wonder and that she did not choose another, like, mean, evil lady scene, okay? Because she's mm -hmm. killing it. So Sora's, Sora's mom's caretaker, the random Andrew mother that's taking care of her mom, you know, goes with her to the morgue to ID her husband. And the whole time Sora is just side-eyeing her evil dead husband literally like this. <laughs> Meanwhile, the caretaker is flipping out, crying, sobbing. What do we do? Oh my god, my poor lady, my poor missus. She's so young and she's already a widower. I just feel so bad for you. I just feel so bad for you. <laughs> she's like scream crying and Sora is just... When Sora finally talks, she asks to the doctors, are you sure he's actually dead? <laughs> Excuse me? I mean, he just looks very comfortable. Oh, uh, yeah, he's dead. 
Sawyer gets taken into the police station to answer a few questions. And she states that Ben had dropped her off at her mom's house the night before to stay there because she's been struggling with morning sickness because she's pregnant. And uh, she just needed her mom to take care of her. Anyway, she was on her way back home about to leave her mom's apartment when she got a call that he was dead. So it's established that sometime before drop after dropping her off, before the call, sometime after that he died. Sora mentions that he wanted to go night fishing with some hospital doctor, Dr. Park or something, uh, the director of the QMI hospital. He's, he's on TV and stuff. And you're sure that your husband was going to meet with him to talk about work? Yeah, why do you ask? Sora, your husband was fired from his position a month ago. Sora seems shocked, but not in a betrayed way, but more in like a that mother forker way. So was there anything about his behavior the day he dropped you off that was out of the ordinary? She thinks about the, the fishing bag that he wants to fill with cash, the phone, but she states, no, nothing. And the caretaker next to her that we didn't even know was still there starts sobbing yet again. That's the kind of guy Ben was, you know? He was suffering when he was laid off from his job, but he would never show it to anyone. What's going on? What's going on here? Bro, I don't know. It's just like oh. the juxtaposition of Sora being straight-faced and the yeah. caretaker just popping up out of nowhere sobbing. Yeah, what's wrong with her? I don't know, okay? Meanwhile, Sora is fixated on the police officers having their lunch break in the back, just down in a bowl of jajangmyeon black bean noodles. And immediately after leaving the police station, she tells the caretaker as much that she wants to spend some time alone to grieve, and she goes straight to a a black bean noodle shop and starts downing black bean noodles. I mean, downing, like to the point where the server is like, oh, egg your mouth, just like baby mom, please, no one's, no one wants your food. Calm down, who's chasing you? <sighs> it's like such a telling scene, it's so emotional, but it's all done through eating, but you can tell it's almost like this freedom that she's experiencing, mm. even in the way she eats, or even in what she eats, how she chooses to mm. eat it, when she eats. Like, there is so much freedom in this meal. Mm -hmm. And she's downing this bowl of black bean noodles when the caller ID rings, her phone rings, and it says, not my family. But it can also translate to a play on words that's like, my man's family. Mm. Like, name family, like, namjai family. But mm. then also, name means like, like another person's family. Mm -hmm. So it's her brother-in-law calling to yell. Sora, where the hell is my brother? He came to my wife's pharmacy and ordered thousands of that stuff. Sora is still slurping away on black bean noodles. She's now stopping. How can he ghost us after all of that? I'm going to ship the merchandise back to his house so you guys can take care of it. I don't want to say this, but go ahead, just say it. I'm planning on cutting ties with my brother. My parents are thinking the same thing as me. Brother-in-law, sorry, but the ties have already been cut. What do you mean they've been cut? Did he say that? Oh my god, unbelievable. That f***ing ungrateful ba- No, 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 brother-in-law, sorry. That's not why I said the ties were cut. Sorry, your brother is dead. Excuse me? What did you just say? He- he what? He died. It's you, he died. Uh, hold on, excuse me. Ajima, can I get a Coke? Sora? Sorry, I'm in the middle of eating right now, so I'm gonna have to call you back later. <laughs> And she slams her phone down. She does not answer to nobody anymore. And she's downing these noodles, okay? Then she heads back home. And at her door, there's a box of just, I don't know, whatever that merchandise was. We have no idea what's in there. I don't think she knows either, nor does she care. She goes into the house, and she's got a bag filled with organic strawberries and gets to cleaning all the trash out. All of his clothes, all of his bullshit. He's, she's throwing it away. And then she stumbles upon a box. It looks like an empty like drawer organizer, but when she moves it to throw it away, there's kind of like a second sound as if there's something in there, but there's nothing in there. She keeps shaking it. It's like something's moving around, hitting the walls. So then she goes to the back and she cuts it open and there's a journal in there. Yeah, a black notebook filled with all these sticky notes sticking out from the sides. Whatever it is, it's extremely detailed. She opens it up and starts reading. She has an incredible poker face, so it's hard to say what she's thinking or what she's looking at, but it doesn't look good. Now, back at the mansion, Jules wakes up late to the sound of someone cooking breakfast. She puts on her robe, and she sees her husband and Sawyer already sitting at the table. Sawyer is very interesting. We don't know if he's giving angsty teen vibes, or if like he's got some issues of his own, right? He's clearly not doing great. This is a thriller. Something must be going on. Anyway, Jules asks James when he got home, and without skipping a beat, he lies straight to her face. Oh, I didn't go. It was pouring rain and I didn't feel like leaving. Hey, babe, I know you like your eggs sunny side. <laughs> I think I failed this one. Do you want me to make you a new one? Jules sits down. 
It's okay, I'll eat it. I woke up in the middle of the night and you weren't there. I assumed that you were gone. Yeah, I would have gone, but it had just been, you know, it wasn't even just rain, it was like literal downpour, right? I guess I fell asleep in the study pre prepping for my seminar. Honey, you want some coffee, right? She nods and he pours her a glass and he's about to pour Sawyer a glass of milk, but Jules stops her. Honey, no, Sawyer is lactose intolerant, remember? If he drinks milk, his stomach's gonna hurt. Wow. Is he there? Yeah. And everyone goes silent before the husband goes, right. I can't believe I forgot. And oh. it's this moment of, oh shit. What about the milk that he brought to Sawyer ro Sawyer's room saying that mom told me to tell you to drink it while it's warm? Yeah. If Sawyer is suspicious, he doesn't make it obvious. And James tries to change the conversation once again. Sawyer, you're going to your aunt's memorial, right? Do I have to go? Sawyer, if you say it like that, you're gonna make your mother sad. Jules looks a little hurt, but she tries to explain. Had your aunt been alive, she would have loved you very much. Okay, I'll go. I'll go get ready now. So they finish up and they all get dressed in black and start heading to the church. Side note, Jules notices a lot of inconsistencies in her husband's lies once more. She goes to put on her shoes and she sees his fishing boots are fresh, like have fresh wet mud on them. She walks out to his car and notices fresh mud and leaves stuck on the tires. She even asks when's the last time he had a car wash and he said sometime last week. She's suspicious, but she still tries to trust him, or at least she has the best, the world's best poker face. And they walk into this intense Catholic church where all the neighborhood moms are there with like veils on their head, mourning the dead. I don't know what this is. How does everyone have like a joint memorial? Did everyone die on the same day? I don't know what's going on, okay? But everyone's like doing their whole thing. And Jesu, the yellow Porsche neighbor, even walks in and everyone starts whispering. Oh my God, she got out. You didn't know? She moved right back into that house. Oh, she's got no fear, huh? Do you think she really killed him? I mean, judging by the fact that she got out in like six years, don't you think? Man, what kind of person kills their husband, huh? Sawyer so overhears some of this conversation and he glances back to see Jesus sitting there in all black, ignoring the gossipers, and when they make eye contact, she winks at him. She might have killed her husband, but she seems kind of fun, honestly. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> When I am not researching cases or cooking up the most insane culinary combinations that you have ever seen, okay? You can find me in the corner of my room whispering into my phone. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's because I'm practicing my Mandarin and my Mandarin accent with Rosetta Stone. So Rosetta Stone has a voice recognition feature that tells me if I'm pronouncing things right, which I find to be very useful, okay? I am a little nervous and a little scared to do it in front of people who actually speak Mandarin, like my soon-to-be sister-in-law, like my soon-to-be mother-in-law and father-in-law. I feel a tiny bit embarrassed, but Rosetta Stone does not judge me. They check my pronunciation and tell me what I did well on and what I need to work on, and it's just so motivating to see more and more of the green words on the screen the more that I practice. And side note, Rosetta Stone is the most trusted language learning system. You can get it on desktop or as an app and they have so many languages on there. Korean, Spanish, Italian, Japanese, French, Chinese. Listen, I'm having a freaking blast learning in Mandarin. I'm trying to go to Shanghai later this year. Okay, so this is perfect. And yeah, yeah, Mandarin is my fiance's primary language, but that's not all. It is scientifically proven that learning a second language as an adult is like an exercise for your brain. Oh uh, yeah, it's gonna be worth it. I'm gonna be 90 years old telling you another thriller, but in Mandarin. My brain's gonna be sharp, boo-boo. <laughs> and with Rosetta Stone, I love that they give me an estimated time that each lesson will take. So if I'm waiting for my ramen to boil, I can go on the app and select a six minute lesson to be done right as my noodles are ready. If I'm in New York and on the train, I can choose a lesson that I can finish by the time that my next train comes. But my favorite feature is the see and speak feature. I started using this recently and it's like a scavenger hunt. So I pick a topic and let's say I choose the fruit scavenger hunt. It gives me five challenges and each challenge is a fruit word in Mandarin. And I see the word and I try to remember what fruit it corresponds to. And as soon as I remember it, I run to the fridge and I try to take a picture of that fruit and they check if I'm right. I know you're like, wait, that sounds like kind of crazy that you're like running around. They have not running around lessons, but the reason that this works is if I run around and I touch an orange, I'm gonna remember it so much better. So don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. For a very limited time, our listeners can get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 50% off. That's $149 for unlimited access to 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Redeem your 50% off at rosettastone.com slash baking today. That's rosettastone.com slash baking today. 
So after the service, the Park family get in the car, they see the yellow Porsche following them home, but not really like following them because they live across the street from one another. But James keeps glancing in the mirror and he says, that annoying lady isn't bothering you, right, honey? Who, has who? No. You know her name? Oh yeah, I think I heard it somewhere. Don't humor her, she's not a great person. I don't think you'll get along with her anyway. So as they park in the garage and wait for the garage door to go down, the police arrive and stop it. Hello, uh, sorry to bother you three, but um, we're with the police department. You are Dr. James Park, correct? Yes, what is this about? Did you know that, did you know Mr. Ben Kim, the pharmaceutical sales rep? He was found dead near the reservoir this morning. We're talking to material witnesses. James turns to Jules, who's clearly shaken up, remembering all the weird things about him, like he definitely went night fishing, okay? And he's like, hey, Sawyer, take your mom into the house. I'm gonna go talk with the police and I'll be back. It's very interesting because Sawyer up until this point, you thought that he loves his mom, right? He's got like a weird relationship with his dad, but loves his mom. But the minute that James leaves, he just like leaves his mom in the garage. And uh, Jules has alone in the garage, she's got flashbacks to her sister being dead and being dragged into an ambulance. Then she wakes up on her couch, so she basically faints. And the neighbor has who is there. Oh, you're awake. Jules is looking at her like she's a home intruder because I mean, I guess she is. Sorry, apparently you fainted. So we were asked for help, so we moved you onto the couch, but you were just gone for a second and you were already having some sort of nightmare. Jules stares at her silently. Oh, um, your house is beautiful and you even have a pool. Do you mind if I come swim one day? My goodness, not even like a speck of dust in this entire house. How do you do it, right? Oh, oh speaking of, seems like you took care of the smell, you know, the smell, it's gone. So then she's like, Thanks for helping me, but I really do need to rest alone, okay? And basically kicks out Hisu out of the house. And I don't know why, but Hisu desperately wants to be friends with her. Now, Jules waits for her husband to come home and day turns to night and her husband is still not home and she starts feeling intense anxiety. She goes to take her anti-anxiety meds, but for the first time, she decides against it. Instead, she runs to her phone and tries to open the home security app and look at the footage between September 19th and September 20th because the early hours of that morning, she doesn't know what happened, but it's been deleted. Well, we don't know if it's been deleted, but it says video can't be found. <laughs> we see Jules go upstairs to talk to her son, Sawyer, and she knocks on his door before walking in and the conversation is absolutely unhinged and weird. She basically just says, Sawyer? Yes, mom? And we see a glass of milk that he drank and a cookie on his desk. Don't drink milk. Your stomach hurts when you drink milk. Here, let me take your tray. And she leaves. It's like, is the milk drugged? And does she know it's drugged? And do they know it's drugged? Are they getting drugged by Dr. James Park? That's what it feels like right now. And he sees her walking down with the tray and she says, you're home. Now this part is very interesting. The way that Dr. James Park stares at her with the glass of milk in her hands on the tray. Uh huh. I got a small glimpse of like, I feel like she's dragging Sawyer with the milk or something. What? Like making Sawyer drink milk and then being like, don't drink milk. Mm. I don't know. The way that he glanced at her in the milk, just something in me was like, it doesn't feel like he's drugging Sawyer. Okay. It was really weird. Okay. It's just really weird. I don't know. I don't know what it is. There's no confirmation. It's a personal theory. It was just really weird. Maybe I'm thinking too much into it. Maybe I'm trying to like make it twisty twisty. But he explains to her that a pharmaceutical sales rep that he used to work with w uh, drowned in the reservoir. So he's going to have to head into Seoul for the funeral. Or like uh, he's going to have to head into the local funeral home for, you know, the thing. For what? For like the little wake. You know? Oh. And Jules says, Ben Kim, right? Is the one that died? He dropped off the fishing bag earlier in the day? Oh yeah, y yes, you know him since you saw him a few times, right? Yeah, and he came by yesterday. That's wild, you know? He was fine yesterday, Jules, and tomorrow we'll be at his funeral. We don't know the future, huh? What if I go with you? Are you sure? I mean, he's not a total stranger and I just feel stuffy being home we're at the hospital all the time. I mean, I won't if you don't feel comfortable, but... And James slowly walks up to brush her hair once more, and he says, you improved a lot, honey. You're considering going to a funeral on a day like this. I'd be happy if you came with me. I get to go on a drive with you for the first time in a while. Yeah, let's go together. 
Okay, I'll hurry and get ready. So he walks off to the restroom to shower and she sits at her vanity staring. And I think for the first time, we're gonna see Sora and Jules meet face to face. And Sora is at the funeral and she's thinking, not about her dead husband, but about the girl's phone that she managed to pry out from her dead husband's car and she's got it in her purse. Huh. She goes to charge it, power it up, and look, you can be dead, but you can't be a cheater is the moral of the story. And she turns it on and there's an incoming call from a guy named Cricket. She picks it up and the guy is screaming like, where's the merchandise? The customers are pissed. It's giving Ben as a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it was weird. So she hangs up, she's scared. She goes to the photo album and there's a video of a bunch of people sitting around in a seedy motel room and there's a naked man with duct tape covering his mouth. They rip it off and you don't see Ben in the video. It seems like he's the one talking or taking the video, but they're screaming at this naked man for trying to sleep with someone that was a minor. So it, the vibe is, um, the, cause you know like scams like this happen sometimes where they get an underage, yeah. you know, and then they trap for blackmail. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now other photos in the albums include pictures of Dr. Park's professional headshots and interviews he had done and pictures of his family and one where he seems to be threatening a girl in a parking lot. Like there's a girl on the floor very scared of a parking lot. It looks like she had fallen or been pushed and he's kind of like squatting who, doctor? Dr. James Park. Oh. And he's kind of squatting and staring her in the face, but she looks terrified. Uh-huh. Yeah, but it's weird. But that girl is the same girl in the video that is underage, that the naked man was, you know, you know. And then there's selfies of her all in this phone. So it looks like this was her, her phone. phone. Yeah. He's yeah. part of the, she's part of the Seems the like squad. it. It's very, like, confusing. But Sora sees this and she thinks, doesn't matter. This is her ticket to a good life. She thinks what she found is what her husband Ben was trying to blackmail the rich family for. He's cheating on his wife, right? Maybe he is doing some weird stuff. So she finds another picture on the phone of a girl. The same girl from the parking lot and the, you know, all of the videos. It's like a mirror selfie. And she sends it to Dr. Park, whose number is saved on this phone already. And the message is a selfie of that girl. And the text reads, Dr. Park, you remember me, don't you? But Dr. Park doesn't see it. Instead, Jules is sitting at the vanity where his phone buzzes and she opens it up. Oh my God. And in comes the shit show. Oh, my oh God. yeah, it's about to get wild. So Sora is laying on the funeral floor, wondering to herself when he's gonna respond and how much he's gonna pay her for this information. <laughs> when she gets interrupted when a man walks in, her brother-in-law, and he informs her that the parents aren't even coming to the, the funeral. So we get some history. Ben is actually not her brother-in-law's brother. Ben's parents died. Mm. And this is their aunt and uh, Ben's aunt and uncle took him in. Mm. And he was raised as their son. But it seems like they couldn't care less about him. So she's zoning out at the table, peeling a mandarin as he's rambling and making excuses of how much they loved Ben, blah, 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 blah. And he even says, look, I don't think my brother should have gone this way. And she's over trying to be nice to men, okay? She says, yeah, well, who wants to go like this? <laughs> no, what I meant was, Sora, is my brother had some debt. I see. An old friend of our father's was doing something new, so Hyung and I invested some money in there. He never told you, huh? So that money is that money, huh? You found out about it? I mean, I guess I was informed by the landlord that our deposit on the house had been taken out. How much did he invest? About 150K. And she spits out her mandarin and she's laughing. Okay. <laughs> You're obviously mistaken. Even if we took out our home deposit, it wouldn't be 150K, not even close. Sorry, there should be a bank loan. Suddenly she's very serious because, you know, when your husband and wife, especially in Korea, his debt is her debt, you know? Doesn't matter that he's dead. It was a scam. Father and I didn't know. We were victims too. That's why Ben was pushing his product into my wife's pharmacy and I couldn't even say no. Anyway, my father wanted me to give you this. He hands her an envelope and she opens it up in front of him. It's $300 in cash. This is it? Excuse me? This is it? Look, you don't have to like Ben, but when you married your pharmacist's wife, he paid for your honeymoon in Hawaii so you wouldn't feel like nothing compared to her, so you could pretend to be a man. We paid for your father's 70th birthday party, we paid for all of your mother's hospital bills, we paid it all. And you want to give me $300?
That's not even money. Yeah, she's a savage now, huh? Yeah. Sister-in-law, <laughs> how can you speak like this? I guess I shouldn't have come. I'll get going, and my parents would have been very incredibly disappointed if they heard you talk like this. Then they should have come if they're that disappointed. They should say sorry that they felt so much resentment for raising their nephew after his parents died. They should apologize for beating their nephew every single day and feeding him cold food. And they should apologize for stealing all their nephew's money to send their only son to college. They should apologize for living such embarrassing lives. And we see Sora break down for the first time with what seems to be compassion and love for her husband. Maybe she feels as if... The way he is was because of what happened to him in his childhood, how he treated everything was what he received. Maybe that's why she stayed for so long. Her work on me comes to comfort her. I guess he still is your husband after all. And you pity him, don't you? Yeah, sometimes I felt bad for him. Almost as bad as I felt for myself. Sora goes to the restroom to wash up, and in that moment, we see Jules come into the restroom to wash her hands. They made it to the funeral. Jules is washing her hands, and Sora is just staring at her like, this girl has no social cues right now, okay? She, it went out the window. She doesn't care. Hello. Jules looks at her. Excuse me? Jules looks terrified, but Sora hands her paper towels. Thank you. Don't mention it. Jules looks down and sees the phone pink phone on the counter with the crazy case. It was in the mirror selfie of the girl that oh, her husband just received. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But Jules tries to play it cool and she leaves the bathroom. She walks out to see her husband on the phone. Um, a bunch of work people are going to meet him there, right? It's like a whole thing. They sign into the registrar, leave an envelope of cash. Did we do that at American funerals? Koreans always leave condolence money. Huh. It's like a thing, yeah like money for the bereaved so that they can like i don't know pay for funeral expenses mm. and stuff right mm. so they go up to his altar and they pay their respects they bow at him and then it's also a korean custom to turn and bow to the remaining family members mm. as like a show of respect and like grief mm. right so they bow and then they bow at sora and it's like just this whole creepy like the way that this is filmed very good now, Dr. Park and his wife are joined by other doctors that seem to know Ben at one point, and they sit down at the funeral to share food, which, by the way, there's, like, food at funerals, okay? And Sora walks straight up to them. Dr. Park, can I talk to you for a moment, please? It's so strange. Even Dr. Park is confused. But he gets up to talk to Sora in private. Meanwhile, Jules is zoning out, like, what the hell is going on, right? Dr. Park's friends try to make small talk. So how has Dr. Park been? Oh, I'm not sure. He got a prescription for sleeping pills the other day. I just wanted to make sure he's all right. He seems really stressed about the upcoming seminar. Uh-oh. Oh. Uh, I wouldn't know. He doesn't bring work home. <laughs> well, uh, we're going to go outside for a smoke real quick. We'll be right back. So the two men leave Jules sitting there completely alone, and she's freaked out. There's not a lot of people in this funeral room, but she turns around, and there's a harmony. Smiling at her. Oh, Grandma. Yeah, Grandma. It's Sora's mom who has dementia. Oh, my goodness. Giggling. Giggling. Meanwhile, outside, Dr. Park is lighting a cigarette while Sora is staring at him. And he notices that she's pregnant, but he doesn't mention anything. What's this about? Why would you want to talk to me rather than spend some time to mourn? She holds the phone. You're being threatened by my husband, right? Because of this? So you're the one that sent me the text. What do you think that this little random girl's phone has anything to do with me? I'm not sure. How come this girly little phone has your number and your family photos saved in it? I guess I'm just very curious, to be honest, Dr. Park. I don't know anything, not yet anyway, but before my husband went to the reservoir, he gave me this as if, as if he knew he wasn't going to come back. Well, if you find something incredible, reach back out to me. Of course, I'll do that. And I will go find the reason that he was blackmailing you. You seem to be incredibly excited, Sora. So what, you find it? Will you blackmail me like the way that your husband did? If I must. Meanwhile, Jules gets up to leave and decides to take the stairs. She spots Sora and her husband talking outside, and she's just watching. She can't hear them, though. I'm sure I don't need to mention this again, but I don't have a reason to make a deal with you. I think I felt this a lot earlier, but... You know, 
You and your husband have a lot in common. Mr. Ben Kim repeatedly made the wrong decisions. He might have done that his whole life, I think. And I believe these wrong decisions led to his death. For the sake of the baby inside of you, I hope you make a different decision. Take care of yourself. And again, I'm so sorry for your loss. He bows and walks off to join his colleagues, and Sora looks up and spots Jules staring at her. Jules freaks out and turns around only to bump straight into Sora's mom. She drops her purse and all of her belongings, and Sora's mom keeps asking, Oh, this is so pretty. Can I have it? Yes, it's fine. And she's throwing everything back into her purse. And, you know, she keeps saying, my son just went to college and graduated and he has a job. I think you should marry him. Oh, that's okay, ma'am. I'm already married. Then you should just be my daughter instead of you don't want to be my daughter-in-law. I'm sorry. I just... I'm sorry, ma'am. I have to go. And as she's waiting for the elevator, she literally, Sora's mom hugs Jules super tight from behind, refusing to let go. Please, you're so pretty. I just want you to be my daughter. Just do, I refuse to let you leave without me. You're going to be my daughter. You're going to take me going home with you. On? Jules is so freaked out. She tries to nicely ask for her to let go, but she doesn't listen. So she kind of pushes her off and she falls on the ground. And Jules immediately is like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And she goes to comfort her. But suddenly she feels a strong arm grab her wrist and lift her off. Get your hand off my mom. Jules tries to nicely apologize. I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to. Listen to me carefully. You don't know anything, do you? But listen, your husband killed my husband. Jules looks so rattled, she stops trying to pull her arm away and she just looks shocked. It's like someone confirmed her suspicions. James comes and he rips Sora's hand off his wife's. What the hell do you think you're doing? And he put his arm around Jules and escorts her into the elevator. Sora looks pissed, but her phone rings. Hello? Is this Ben Kim's wife? Yes, this is. This is the detective at the financial crimes unit and he's supposed to testify today. <sighs> and she sighs. The person you're calling about is dead. He's dead. And she loses it in the funeral home. She's screaming, how many times do I have to f say he's dead? Dead. And she's screaming. So, um, I don't know what's going on with her, but she does drop to her knees sobbing. Meanwhile, Jules goes home to sit in the bath and she remembers the threatening phone call that Ben gave her husband and everything's clicking, the night fishing, all of that. So she thinks that her husband is asleep. She goes into the garage and she starts trying to go through the black box of his camera, but the footage has been deleted. And as she's thinking about all of this, her husband is standing at the garage door. Okay. What are you doing, honey? Oh, I, <laughs> I'm looking for something. What are you looking for? My earring? I was definitely wearing them when we went out, but one side disappeared and I thought maybe I dropped it in the car. Why would it be in the driver's seat though? Cause she's in the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. James gets into the passenger seat and starts looking. Are you sure you lost it here, honey? It's weird because I feel like he knows she's lying, but like they keep doing this whole show, okay? Yeah, I think I dropped it somewhere here. Honey, you're in big trouble now. What? Those were my mom's. She really loved them. She's gonna be very upset when she finds out that you lost them. I'm kidding, I'm only teasing you. It's so dark in here, babe, I can't find anything. I'm gonna help you look for it tomorrow, but if it's not in here, I can buy something similar so my, mo my mom will never have to know. Come on, let's go back inside. He gets out the car and she follows closely behind him, but it's not over, because the next morning she's knocking on her neighbor's door. The neighbor in front of them who also has cameras. Hezu seems so excited to see her and she runs to open the door. Did you want to come drink some tea? Actually, could I go through your cameras? There's something I want to verify. Okay, if you tell me what you want, I'll show you. Someone keeps putting trash in front of our house. Lies. Why would someone put trash in front of your house? I just need to check for a few hours. Exactly. Tell me what you're looking for and I'll let you check. His is not letting it go. So Jules is like, never mind. She goes back to her house and now Hezu is intrigued. We see her going into her footage and watching it while she's eating lunch. She's like into it. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Meanwhile, Jules calls, um, cause you remember Ben, the pharmacist or whatever, the dead guy? 
he had given her a business card and she goes to call that business and says, hey, I'm so sorry I heard about his death. I wanted to get his family's address so that I could send condolence money. And she writes down the address. But Dr. Park is also busy. He's getting weird visits from the police because he had apparently deposited like $100,000 of cash into Ben's secret, Ben's secret bank account a few days before he went missing. And the police are kind of on to him. And he's saying, it's not blackmail, it's not anything, it was just a loan. And the police are like, well then you must be very close with him to loan someone $100,000. And he kind of shrugs it off. So the police are like, oh, well I guess, I don't know, you tell me, is that a lot to you or not a lot to you? So that night, James comes home and he starts getting undressed from the day and he notices in their jewelry watch box that every single one of Jules's earrings is in there. None of them are missing a partner, okay? The, especially the ones that she claimed were missing, the pearl ones. He doesn't say anything though. He's watching TV while Jules is making him a fruit smoothie and he tries to talk to her about something, which I don't know, what the hell is this, okay? He says, I found out about the lady across the street. Yeah, she's actually quite famous. She lived back there like uh, years ago, but she only just recently moved back. Apparently there was a foul smell coming from the house. The neighbors reported it and there was a dead man inside. She was found in there alone. What do you mean found? I don't know, it's really funny. According to her, she said she was the wife of the dead man, but nobody in the neighborhood ever saw her. Nobody ever knew her. Isn't mm. that crazy? How can a person hurt another person? Don't you think? She's obviously bad news. You should be careful around her. Don't humor her for no reason. That's all I'm trying to say. It feels like he knows that she went to her house, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay? But Jules, she goes back to putting away the fruit, but she marches up to her husband. She can't take it anymore. The housewife in her is busting out. And she says, that night. That night? What night? The night you were wanting to go night fishing. You mean the night I didn't go night fishing? Honey, why do I feel like you went out that night? Oh, right, I forgot to bring it up. What? And he leads her out to the car and pulls out a pearl earring. I found it earlier today and I forgot to bring it in. I thought uh, I was gonna go behind your back and buy you a similar pair, but thankfully it was in here. Found it on the ground. If you wear these next time we visit my mom, she'll be so happy. Wait, 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 he's playing mind games? Yeah. He's like, don't talk about it? Yeah, and he tries to hand it to her, but she doesn't take it. What are you doing? Come on, take it. What, was I not supposed to find this? Honey, I never lost that. What are you talking about, honey? You were looking for it in the car, you were so worried. You even looked for it in the middle of the night, you couldn't sleep, isn't that right? I never lost that earring. At this point, Jules is in tears because it feels like I think she got confirmation that her husband is playing games with her. Mm. And her husband looks pissed. Seriously? How am I supposed to answer if you make no sense? You lost it in there, I found it. What's the problem now, huh? Honey, did you forget why we moved here in the first place? You already forgot? I'm asking you. Please just be honest with me, honey. That night you were supposed to go night fishing, you left the house when I woke up. You weren't there in the house. There's, I found all the evidence that you went out, but why do you keep lying to me? By chance. <laughs> you can't be serious right now. You think I killed Ben? <laughs> be honest with me, I'm, I'm your wife, I can help you. Help me? You would help me. Me. Whenever you do stuff like this, do you know how hard it is for me and Sawyer? Do you ever think about that? Because you do this all the time. Our Sawyer, <laughs> shit, and he walks off. Sawyer, wh what about Sawyer? I got a call from his teacher. Why? Apparently he told his teacher that he wanted to unalive himself. Everyone is mocking him behind his back from that incident at his old school. He's still recovering. How do you think he feels, huh? How? Last time it was his teacher, next time it's me. Then who? Is it Sawyer next? So we get some context. Remember how she smacked the teacher with the wooden block? Mm -hmm. It seems like she does transfer some weird paranoia onto people. Mm -hmm. and likes to concoct like murderous narratives. Mm. So it seems like she did that to the teacher, having this narrative in her head that he killed someone. Mm -hmm. And then he's saying, now it's me. Who are you gonna accuse of being a murderer next, Sawyer? Mm. 
Hmm. Ah, oh, so confusing. Yeah, and he's like, what do you want me to do, huh? What do you want? Okay, and do you know what, honey? Even I can get exhausted and tired of this shit. I have limits too. Jewel starts crying and he apologizes. I'm sorry, that was my bad. I just need to get some air. And he gets into his car and he leaves. So Jules waits in the kitchen, waiting for her husband to come home. And in her anxious fit, she goes to her anti-anxiety meds. But instead of taking it, she throws out the entire container. Meanwhile, Sora is eating with her family. And in the middle of it, she finds out that her husband, Ben, had asked recommendations for insurance companies. And she runs out before even finishing her meal. She leaves and runs to the insurance company, finds out that he had five insurance plans for his life. But as of right now, his death is considered um, his own choice. So she can't get the payout. <laughs> well, how much would I get if I can prove that it wasn't his choice? A total of $500,000. Well, it, it wasn't his choice. I would know. So we get a flashback of Sora sitting in the car with her husband that night. And he's dead in the driver's seat. What? So all this time we thought that James killed Ben because he was blackmailing him and Sora was starting to feel some sympathy at least and was trying to blackmail the killers. That's what we thought. But turns out Sora is the killer. And she's going to do everything in her power to blame it on James so that she can get that insurance money. But I mean, is James even a great guy to begin with? I guess we're going to find out. And the episode ends with a flashback of Sora asking Ben when he was alive, her own husband when he was alive, why he thought it was okay to blackmail and manipulate people. Ben blamed it on the world. He said all these people have money and power, they are so desperate to make sure nobody else gets it and that's why he lives in this shitty situation. So he blames everyone, like all these like people that are not even billionaires, okay? Not even government officials. He just blames even his neighbor who's richer than him. Okay. He's like, they're plotting to make me less rich than them, right? So he feels like it's his God-given right to punish everyone. And Sora asks, but why are you the one punishing them? And his response is, does it matter who punishes them if they deserve it? And we see Sora walk back to the hallway of her apartment unit and Jules is standing there waiting for her. Dun, dun, dun. Wait, 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 what, what? She wa Sora walks back to her apartment door and uh -huh. Jules is, remember, cause Jules called to get the address for the condolence money. So we don't know what's gonna happen between Jules and Sora now. Are they gonna be on the same page or they're not gonna uh, be on the same page? Yeah, huh. but I thought the last, the way that episode three ends is very interesting. The way he says, does it matter who punishes them if they deserve it? Yeah, it is interesting. So it's giving some shit's gonna go down. Is Sora gonna be like an anti-hero, anti-hero? Mm. Like what's gonna happen, right? But that is lies hidden in my garden. Let me tell you. The cinematography on this, very interesting. I don't think I've seen another K-drama film this way. It's very well filmed. Like, I mean, we've talked about so many different K-dramas and I've raved about the glory and the plot and like the way that it moves and the characters, but the filming on this really is such a standout. It's very creative. Every scene is so, there's so much vibe in every scene, but it's not in like that annoying, pretentious, I'm a film like major way. Cause sometimes you see these films and I'm like, okay, Try this is- hard. Yes, it's so artsy and I totally get it, but it's so artsy to the point where I don't, I'm not in it. Mm, yeah. It's almost like you're trying to show off to someone that you know how to do these things. Yeah. But this one is all about the viewer reception. And I mean, I would literally just rewatch it just for just the filming of it. So good. The way they build suspense. I will say it's a very, very slow burn. Get ready for the slowness of the show, but... It's burning, though. It's burning something. Yeah, it's yeah. burning. And it's burning, and I'm it's confusing. so curious. I love that there are no heroes and no villains. Everyone seems f***ed up in this, mm. and I really like it. Yeah, because it's, it's interesting, because yeah. your feelings keep shifting and changing. It's complex. It's very, yeah, yeah. It's very good. So, with that being said, let me know if you guys want a part two and I can finish it up. But I think next week we're going to do a book because you'll see. There's a whole theme to this. But I hope you guys enjoyed today's episode. Let me know in the comments and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.